It's a calm Wednesday morning when Nika Williams, a highly trained and respected agent of the United States Secret Service, finds herself driving through a quiet suburban neighborhood. The Nika, who has earned a stellar reputation for her work in cybersecurity and national security, is en route to an important meeting regarding a new case that threatens to destabilize the country's critical infrastructure. Despite her status as an agent, Today, she's traveling undercover in an unmarked vehicle, a sleek new black sub that belongs to a colleague. The car's registration isn't in her name, and Nika is dressed casually, with no outward signs of her high-ranking position. The sun beams down on the well-manicured streets as Nika navigates through a series of intersections, her mind preoccupied with the details of her case. Her keen instincts, honed through years of intense training and fieldwork, tell her that something might feel off, but she brushes it aside. After all, it's a normal day, or so she believes. As she pulls up to a red light, waiting for the signal to turn green, two police officers sitting in a patrol car on the opposite side of the intersection notice her vehicle. Officers Blake and Hansen, both in their late thirties, have been working together for years. Blake, in particular, has always been more suspicious and aggressive, often operating with unspoken racial biases that manifest in his daily interactions. Hansen, while less confrontational, tends to follow Blake's lead, preferring to avoid unnecessary conflict with his partner. They have their routine down, Blake drives, and Hansen usually handles the initial contact. Today, however, Blake's eyes are drawn to Nika's sub. It's an expensive-looking vehicle in an area where such cars are uncommon. A quick scan of the license plate reveals that the car is registered to a different name, and Blake's interest is piqued. Without thinking twice, he decides to make a traffic stop, convinced that something is off. Perhaps it's stolen. Perhaps the driver is involved in something illegal. His mind races with assumptions, none of which have any basis beyond his initial glance. Blake speaks into his radio. Dispatch, this is Unit 12 requesting a vehicle stop. Black sub, possible suspicious activity. We'll be checking it out. Over. Copy that to Unit 12. The dispatcher responds. Hansen glances over at Blake, noting the intensity in his partner's expression. What's the reason for the stop? He asks casually, knowing Blake often operates on gut instinct rather than hard facts. Blake shrugs, his tone dismissive. Just a hunch. That car doesn't fit in here, and the registration doesn't match. Let's see what they're up to. Hansen, while not entirely comfortable with the situation, doesn't object. After all, Blake's hunches had led to arrests before, but something in the back of his mind nags at him, a small voice of doubt that he chooses to ignore for the moment. As they trail Nika's sub, Blake flicks on the lights and siren. The shrill wail echoes through the quiet streets, startling a few pedestrians nearby. Nika glances in her rearview mirror and sees the flashing lights of the police car behind her. A surge of adrenaline hits her system, but she remains calm. This isn't the first time she's been stopped, though her instincts tell her that this stop feels different. As she slows down, signaling as she pulls over to the side of the road, her mind immediately begins to process the situation. Two officers, no backup. Suburban neighborhood. Her training kicks in, reminding her to remain complainist and cooperative. She's well aware of the current climate in the country, where misunderstandings between law enforcement and the people of color often spiral out, out of control. Still, Nika is no ordinary citizen. She's a federal agent, trained to handle high-pressure situations, even when they feel wrong. As her vehicle comes to a stop, she carefully reaches into her bag to retrieve her identification. As she knows the drill, stay calm, follow instructions, and above all, don't make any sudden movements. She's dealt with countless high-tension moments, but today there's a pit in her stomach she can't quite shake. Officer Blake exits the patrol car first, his hand resting on his holster as he approaches Nika's sub. Hansen follows close behind, his demeanor more relaxed but still alert. 
Blake's eyes narrow as he observes Nika through the tinted window, his suspicions intensifying. He taps on the window with more force than necessary, signaling for her to roll it down. She obliges, rolling down the window and looking up at the officers with a composed expression. Good morning, officers. Is there a problem? She asks, her voice steady. Blake's eyes flicker with distrust as he takes in her appearance. To him, she doesn't look like someone who should be driving a high-end sub. His unspoken biases color his perception of the situation before she's even said more than a few words. License and registration, Blake demands his tone sharp and devoid of any pleasantries. There's an edge to his voice that immediately puts Nico on guard. She nods, handing over her driver's license. This is a government vehicle, registered to the U.S. Secret Service. I'm an agent. I can show you my credentials if you'd like, she says, her tone professional yet calm, as she reaches toward the glove compartment where her federal ID is kept. Blake's expression shifts from suspicion to disbelief. Secret Service. Yeah, right? You got a badge to back that up? His voice drips with sarcasm as he takes a step closer to the vehicle. He's heard all kinds of stories from drivers trying to get out of tickets. But this one takes the cake, he thinks. A black woman in an expensive car claiming to be a federal agent. Not likely. Nika maintains her composure, though inwardly, her frustration builds. She's been in situations like this before, but the underlying hostility in Blake's tone tells her that this could escalate quickly if not handled delicately. I have my credentials in the glove compartment, officer. If you'll allow me to reach for them, she responds carefully, her eyes watching both officers' movements. Hanson, standing a few feet behind Blake, shifts uncomfortably. He's seen this type of situation escalate before, and something about Nika's calm demeanor makes Gorm question Blake's aggressive approach. But years of partnership have taught him not to interfere unless absolutely necessary. Blake, however, isn't interested in listening. His mind is already made up. Stay in the car. He snaps, cutting her off before she can explain further. Step out of the vehicle now. Kinar hesitates for a brief moment, her instinct screaming at her that this is not going the way it should. She's a federal agent on official business, but none of that seems to matter right now. Slowly, she unbuckles her seatbelt and steps out of the vehicle, keeping her hands visible at all times. Blake moves in closer, eyeing her with thinly veiled contempt. Let's see what you've got in there, he mutters, nodding toward the vehicle. As Nika steps aside, Blake pushes past her, leaning into the car to inspect the interior. His eyes fall on a sleek, encrypted tablet sitting on the passenger seat, a piece of highly sensitive government equipment used for her work in cybersecurity. He picks it up, turning it over in his hands with a sneer. What's this? Some kind of hacking device? Blake asks, his voice dripping with accusation. Nika takes a deep breath, keeping her voice calm despite the growing tension. It's a work device. I'm authorized to carry it. But Blake isn't listening. He's already convinced himself that Nika is involved in something nefarious, and nothing she says will change his mind. Turn around, he orders, his hand going to his cuffs. You're under arrest. Nika's heart pounds in her chest, but she doesn't resist. She's been trained for this, but even training can't prepare her for the humiliation and injustice of being wrongfully detained. As the cold metal of the handcuffs snaps around her wrists, she glances over at Hansen, who remains silent, his face etched with uncertainty. In that moment, Nika realizes that this situation is far from over and the worst is yet to come. Nika stands on the side of the road, the handcuffs tight around her wrists as Officer Blake looms over her. The air feels tense, thick with unspoken hostility. Her mind races, calculating the best course of action, but her years of training tell her that resisting now would only make things worse. If she needs to keep her composure, even as she feels the weight of Blake's accusations pressing down on her. She's dealt with difficult situations before, but this is different. This feels personal. Blake turns back to her, 
holding up the encrypted tablet he found in the souve, a smug look plastered on his face. What is this, huh? Some kind of hacking device? Planning to steal some data or maybe you've already done it? Nika, her expression still calm, meets his gaze. Officer, that's a government-issued device. I'm a federal agent, as I've already explained. If you allow me to access my ID in the glove compartment, I can show you my credentials. Blake's eyes narrow, his expression one of disbelief mixed with disdain. He doesn't believe her, not one word. To him, she's just another person trying to talk her way out of trouble. And the fact that she's black, driving an expensive car, and claims to be a secret service agent only fuels his already deeply ingrained prejudices. Sure, Blake says, dragging the word out sarcastically. A secret service agent, huh? That's rich. You must think I'm stupid. He gestures for Hansen, who has been standing quietly by to keep an eye on Nicker while he continues to rummage through the vehicle. Officer Hansen, who up until this point has been passive, shifts uncomfortably. He's not as sure as Blake that this is the right course of action. Nicker's calm, professional demeanor doesn't match the profile of someone involved in criminal activity. And then there's the fact that she's been nothing but cooperative. Still, Hansen stays silent, not wanting to go against his partner, though a flicker of doubt begins to gnaw at him. Gaka consents Hansen's hesitation and decides to address him directly. Officer Hansen, she says, her voice firm but respectful. I understand your partner's concerns, but if you give me the chance to access my ID, this can all be cleared up quickly. You're making a mistake here. Hansen shifts awkwardly but doesn't respond. Blake, overhearing the exchange, turns and sneers. You're a mistake. Lady, only mistake here is you thinking you can lie your way out of this. Now, shut up and stop trying to play the victim. Kimika bites her tongue, the tension rising in her chest. The anger she feels at being wrongfully accused and treated with such blatant disrespect simmers just below the surface, but she knows better than to let it show. So that Blake isn't looking for an explanation, he's looking for confirmation of his own biases. And she knows that any further protest on her part could be twisted into something it's not. Blake pulls away from the sub, tossing the tablet carelessly back onto the passenger seat. You know what I think. I think you're full of it. I think you stole this car, and that device right there is proof that you're up to no good, probably working with a cybercriminal gang or something. I've seen this kind of thing before. Kanika holds his gaze, her voice measured. I haven't stolen anything. That's my colleague's car, and I'm on official business. You're making assumptions based on nothing. Blake's eyes flare with anger at her calm rebuttal. You want to keep running your mouth? Or are you going to come clean? Cause if you don't, things are about to get a lot worse for you. He steps closer, invading her personal space, his posture aggressive. Kinaika doesn't back down, but she chooses her next words carefully. I've told you the truth, officer. I'm not here to argue with you. I know my rights, and I know you're acting outside of protocol. But I also know this situation doesn't have to escalate any further. Blake scoffs shaking his head. You know your rights? Well, good for you, but around here I call the shots. Not you. So you're gonna listen to what I say, and right now, I say you're under arrest. So I will see what the station thinks about your little story. Before Nika can respond, Blake moves swiftly, grabbing her by the arm and leading her toward the patrol car. Hanson watches from the side, his discomfort growing by the second, but still... He says nothing. His silence weighs heavily on him, but he rationalizes it by telling himself that Blake is the senior officer and that he should trust his judgment. Yet something about the way Blake is handling this feels wrong, very wrong. As Blake roughly places Nika into the back seat of the patrol car, she continues to maintain her composure, but internally she's bracing herself for what's to come. She knows this isn't just about her being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's about Blake's assumptions, his biases, and his willingness to ignore the facts because they don't fit the narrative he's already built in his head. Once Nicker is secured in the back of the car, 
Blake returns to Hansen. We'll run her through the system at the station, see if any warrants pop up. If she's clean, we'll book her for resisting arrest and make sure she knows not to try this stunt again. But something tells me she's not clean. Hansen nods, though the pit in his stomach grows. What if she is who she says she is? He ventures, his voice low. What if she really is an agent? Blake shoots him a withering look. An agent? Don't be naive. You really believe, believe that? Come on, Hansen. She's playing us. Hansen wants to argue, but the words stick in his throat. He knows he should say something, push back, question the arrest, but years of working in a system that values loyalty to your partner over questioning authority keeps him silent. The doubt gnaws at him, but he convinces himself to wait and see how things play out at the station. Maybe Blake is right. Maybe Nika is lying. As they drive to the station, Nika sits in the back seat, her mind whirring. She knows her situation is serious, but she's also confident that the truth will come out. Colleagues in the Secret Servicy Service will vouch for her, and once she gets access to her phone, this misunderstanding will be cleared up. But still, there's an underlying fear, a fear that even when the truth is revealed, the damage has already been done. Blake pulls into the station parking lot, his expression smug as he exits the vehicle and pulls Nika out. The officers inside watch curiously as Blake leads her toward the processing area. Nika's professional instincts kick in, scanning her surroundings, noting the layout of the station and the officers present. She remains calm, but her heart pounds in her chest. She's seen how these situations can spiral, how power can corrupt, and how easily the truth can be twisted. Inside the station, Blake pushes her toward a desk where a female officer is handling intake. The officer raises an eyebrow at Blake, clearly curious about the situation. What do we have here? Blake grins, the arrogance dripping from his voice. Caught ourselves a real winner. Says she's a Secret Service agent. Can you believe that? Probably involved in some kind of cybercrime. Found an encrypted device in her car. I'm thinking we've got a hacker on our hands. The female officer looks Nico over, her expression neutral, though her eyes flicker with a hint of suspicion. Is that right? She says, her tone flat as she looks at Nika. Nika meets her gaze, still composed. I am a secret service agent. I have credentials in the vehicle, but your officers refuse to let me show them. The female officer glances at Blake, who just seeks his, his head dismissively. Don't listen to her, but she's just trying to make herself sound important. Let's get her processed, and we'll figure out the rest later. The female officer nods, pulling out the forms for processing, while Blake moves to the other side of the desk, clearly satisfied with how things are going. Hanson, standing nearby, watches the scene unfold, his unease now palpable. He knows his, he should say something, anything but his fear of causing conflict with Blake keeps him silent. As Nika is led through the humiliating process of being booked, fingerprinted, photographed, and her personal items taken, she remains calm, though inside, her frustration grows. She knows that the longer this drags on, the harder it will be to reverse the damage. Her reputation, her work, everything she's built over the years could be tarnished by this one wrongful arrest, and for what? because an officer couldn't see past his own prejudices. But once the booking is complete, Nika is placed in a holding cell, the cold metal bench beneath her only adding to the surreal nature of the situation. But she's been on the other side of this process many times, ensuring that justice is served. But now, she's the one being treated like a criminal, and the bitter irony isn't lost on her. While she sits in the cell, Waiting for her chance to contact her team, she knows that this isn't over. Far from it. This is just the beginning of a fight, one that she's determined to win. Nika sits on the cold bench inside the holding cell, her mind racing as she contemplates the surreal situation she's found herself in. The sterile smell of the station and the hum of from of scent lights above add to the discomfort, but what grates at her the most is the injustice of it all. But she's been detained, handcuffed, and booked like a criminal, 
all based on the unfounded suspicions of an officer driven by biases and assumptions. Kyaka knows she must remain calm, but the longer she sits there, the more difficult it becomes to suppress the rising frustration bubbling within her. Meanwhile, back at the front desk, Officer Blake is busy spinning his version of the story to his toy colleagues. His tone is casual, almost boastful, as he relays the details of the arrest. I pulled her over, and right off the bat, I could tell something was off. Henny, she's driving and sub registered to someone else, claiming she's with a secret service, he scoffs, shaking his head. Can you believe that? A secret service agent? In this neighborhood? Not a chance. The officers around him chuckle, nodding along as Blake continues. He's convinced of his version of the story, convinced that Nika is a criminal who's been caught red-handed, and nothing she says or does will change that. The officer Hansen, however, is standing on the sidelines, so silent and uneasy. He's been quiet ever since they arrived at the station, watching Blake's behavior with some growing discomfort. Hansen isn't sure what's more troubling, the fact that Blake is so calm, but Blake is so convicted's guilt, or the fact that he's refused to give her the chance to prove otherwise. Hansen clears his throat and steps forward, his voice tentative. Blake, don't you think we should at least check her credentials? I mean, what if she's telling the truth? If she really is with the Secret Service, this could turn into a serious problem for us. Blake turns to him a smirk tugging at the corners of his mouth. Come on, Hanson. You really believe that? She's just trying to get out of trouble. I've seen it a thousand times before. So people will say anything when they're backed into a corner. He leans in closer, his voice lowering. Besides, even if she is telling the truth, she was acting suspicious, and we found that encrypted tablet in Kinawa Jean-Louis for questioning him. Hansen hesitates, glancing toward the holding area where Nika is being kept. His instincts are screaming at him that something is wrong, that Blake is pushing this too far, but he can't bring himself to argue. Blake is his partner, and going against him could have consequences for both of them. So, Hansen bites his tongue and nods, though the doubt lingers. Blake, feeling bolstered by Hansen's silence, continues his tirade. We're going to take a closer look at that tablet she was carrying. I bet there's something on there, maybe stolen data or worse. She's probably part of some hacking ring, trying to pull off a cyber attack. That's why she's so desperate to convince us she's legit. But without another word, Blake strides off toward the evidence room, where the encrypted tablet has been placed for further investigation. As he walks... His mind races with the possibilities of what could be on the device. He's already convinced himself that this is no ordinary traffic stop, that Nika Williams is involved in something is involved in Vajtar than she's letting on. The more he thinks about it, the more certain he becomes that he's stumbled onto a significant bust, and the thrill of it clouds his judgment even further. Inside the holding cell, Nika remains seated, her hands resting on her knees as she waits for any sign that this nightmare is about to end. She knows her rights, knows that she should have been allowed to contact her superior by now, but the officers have been dragging their feet at every turn. Her phone was confiscated along with her other personal items, and every time she's asked to make a call, she's been told to wait. The frustration gnaws at her, but she keeps her composure. For now... The door to the holding area creaks open, Hansen steps inside, his face lined with uncertainty. He walks up to the bars of Nika's cell, looking down at her with a mixture of guilt and unease. Kamika meets his gaze, her eyes sharp and focused. She can tell he's conflicted, and she seizes the opportunity. You know this isn't right, Nika says, her voice low but firm. You know I haven't done anything wrong. You've seen my ID, you've heard my explanation. You can still fix this. Hansen shifts on his feet, glancing around to make sure no one is watching. Look, I don't know what's going on here, he mutters, his tone defensive. But Blake, he's convinced you're hiding something. Anika raises an eyebrow, incredulous. Hiding something? I've been completely transparent. I told you who I am, and I told you what I was doing. Your partner is making assumptions and you know it. Hansen looks away, guilt flickering in his eyes. It's not that simple. 
Blake thinks there's something on that, that tablet, and until we can prove otherwise, we have to hold you for questioning. Nika's patience snaps. She stands up, walking closer to the bars as she locks eyes with Hansen. You know as well as I do that there's nothing illegal on that tablet. It's a government-issued device. You have no grounds to detain me, and the longer you let this go on, the worse it's going to get for both of you. Hansen takes a step back, uncomfortable with the intensity in her gaze. Look, I'm just following protocol, he says weakly, though even he doesn't believe his own words. I'll talk to Blake, see if we can speed things up. Jamaica watches as Hansen hurries out of the holding area, the weight of his indecision clear in every step he takes. She knows she's gotten to him, planted a seed of doubt, but she also knows it may not be enough. Blake is the one driving this, and until someone higher up intervenes, she's stuck. For a while, in the evidence room, Blake has his hands on the encrypted tablet, turning it over as if expecting it to reveal its secrets at any moment. He's already contacted the department's IT team, requesting that they take a closer look at the device, but the process is slow, and Blake's impatience grows by the minute. His mind is racing with possibilities, data theft, hacking, cyber-terrorism, and each new theory only feeds his determination to uncover something incriminating. A few minutes later, the IT technician arrives, a middle-aged man with glasses and a laptop slung over his shoulder. He greets Blake with a nod and sets up equipment on a nearby desk. So, what do we have here? The technician asks, glancing at the tablet. Blake folds his arms across his chest, his expression serious. I pulled this from a suspect's car, and she's claiming to be a Secret Service agent, but I think she's involved in something bigger maybe cybercrime. I need you to get into this thing and find out what she's hiding. The technician raises an eyebrow but doesn't question Blake's assessment. He plugs the tablet into his laptop and begins the process of attempting to break through the encryption. It's a sophisticated system, one that clearly belongs to a government-issued device, and the technician's brow furrows as he works. This is high-level encryption, the technician mutters after a few minutes. It's not something I can break into easily. It's going to take some time. But Blake's frustration mounts. I don't care how long it takes. I need to know what's on that date tablet. The technician nods and continues his work, but Blake's mind is already spinning with worst-case scenarios. He's convinced that Nika is part of some elaborate criminal operation, and the fact that the encryption is so advancedly strongly strengthens a belief that she's hiding something. As the minutes tick by, Blake paces the room, his impatience growing with each step. His phone buzzes, and he pulls it out of his pocket, glancing at the screen. It's a text from Hansen. We need to talk. Something's not right about this. Blake frowns, irritation flashing across his face. He quickly types out a response, not now. Stay with the suspect. I'm handing it. Back in the holding cell, Nika is starting to feel the weight of the situation. She knows the longer this drags on, the more difficult it will be to reverse the damage. Every minute she spends locked up is another minute. The Blake has to build a case against her, a case based on nothing but his own prejudices and assumptions. Her thoughts are interrupted by the sound of the holy area door opening again. This time it's the female officer from earlier, the one who processed her. The officer approaches the Sasson with a clipboard in hand, her expression unreadable. Williams, right? The officer says, glancing at the clipboard. And Nika nods, standing up and facing the officer. That's right, and I'd like to speak to someone in charge. This is a wrongful detention, and I've been denied access to my legal rights. The officer's eyes flicker with something, maybe recognition, maybe sympathy but she keeps her tone neutral. You're just here to ask a few questions, she says. Standard procedure. Pika raises an eyebrow, sceptical. Standard procedure. I've been here for hours, and I've yet to speak to anyone who's willing to listen to me. The officer shifts her weight, clearly uncomfortable with the situation. Look, I don't know the full story here. I'm just doing my job. 
If you cooperate, we can get this sorted out sooner. Onika takes a deep breath, knowing that this officer isn't the one in control, but hoping that she might at least be a way to escalate, escalate the issue. Fine. What do you need to know? The officer pulls out a pen, ready to jot down notes. What were you doing in that neighborhood today? And I was on my way to a meeting, Nika replies calmly. I work in cybersecurity for the Sacred Service. I was on official business. The officer jots down her response, her expression neutral. And the vehicle, you said it wasn't registered in your name. Nika nods. Correct. It belongs to a colleague. I borrowed it for the day. The officer scribbles another note. And the device we found in the car, the encrypted tablet. Can you explain that? Nika's frustration flares again, but she keeps her voice steady. It's a government-issued device. It's part of my job. There's nothing suspicious about it, and I have clearance to carry it. The officer hesitates, glancing down at her notes. And you're saying you have credentials to prove you're with the Secret Service? Yes, Nika says, her patience wearing thin. But your officers refuse to let me show them. My ID is in the glove compartment of the vehicle. The officer nods slowly, processing the information. Okay, I'll pass this along to my superiors, but for now you'll have to wait. Yeah, Walker watches as the officer turns and walks out of the holding area, leaving her alone once again. The frustration and anger inside her are building, but she knows she can't let show. Not yet. In the evidence room... The IT technician is still working on cracking the encryption on the tablet. Blake looms over him, his impatience palpable. How much longer, he demands. The technician sighs, wiping sweat from his brow. This is going to take hours, if not longer. It's high-level encryption, government grade. If this really is a secret service device, we might not be able to get in at all without the proper clearance. Blake's expression darkens, but before he can respond, his phone buzzes again. This time it's a call from the front desk. He picks up, his voice sharp. Blake here. Officer Blake, we've got a problem, the voice on the other end says. There's someone from the Secret Service here, be. They're asking about the suspect you brought in. Blake's stomach drops, but he quickly masks his reaction. I'll handle it, he says hanging up the phone and marching out of the room, his mind racing. As Blake walks toward the front desk, his confidence begins to waver. He spent the entire day convinced that Nika was lying, but now that the surface Iris is involved, he's starting to realize just how deep a hole he might have dug for himself. Yet Officer Blake's footsteps echo through the corridors of the police station as he makes his way to the front desk, his face a mask of forced calm, Though his mind is racing, the news that someone from the Secret Service has arrived survive us aches his confidence, but he's not ready to admit defeat yet. After all, in his mind, Nika Williams could still be lying, could still be part of some elaborate scheme. But there's a small, creeping doubt that's starting to take root, one that he can't quite ignore. But when Blake reaches the front desk, he spots a tall, well-dressed man standing near the counter. The man exudes authority, his posture straight, his expression unreadable. His dark suit, crisp white shirt, and carefully placed lapel pin, the unmistakable emblem of the U.S. Secret Service, mark him as someone important. Blake swallows hard but approaches with the same bluster he's used all day to assert control over the situation. Officer Blake, he introduces himself, extending a hand, though it feels like a formality now. I'm the one who brought in the suspect. What's the issue? The Secret Service agent, who introduces himself as Special Agent Tyler Briggs, eyes Blake's outstretched hand for a moment before shaking it. His grip is firm, but the tension in the air is palpable. The issue, Officer Blake, is that you've detained one of our own, Briggs says, his voice calm but edged with steel. Agent Nika Williams is a highly respected member of our cybersecurity team, and we've been alerted to her unauthorized detainment. Blake's heart skips a beat, but his face remains neutral. 
I understand your concern, Agent Briggs, but I had reason to believe the suspect was involved in illegal activity. She was driving a car not registered in her name, and we found an encrypted device in her possession. It raised red flags. Pix's expression doesn't change. If anything, he looks more irritated than before. Agent Williams was on official business. The car was borrowed from a colleague, and that encrypted device you're referring to is government property, a standard issue for an agent in her role. Blake opens his mouth to respond, but Briggs holds up a hand, cutting him off. I've already spoken to your superiors. Agent Williams is to be released immediately, and all charges against her will be dropped. We'll be taking her into our custody. For a brief moment, Blake feels the floor shift beneath him. He's made a terrible mistake, and now, with the full weight of the Secret Service bearing down on him, he realizes just how badly on, but his pride and years of operating under his own flawed assumptions won't let him back down so easily. With all due respect, Agent Briggs, Blake says, his tone still defensive, we're still investigating this matter. We found what we believe to be suspicious materials in her possession, until we can fully confirm her story. Briggs's gaze hardens, his patience clearly wearing thin. This is not a negotiation, Officer Blake. You've detained an innocent federal agent on false pretenses, and now you're facing the consequences of your actions. And if you continue to obstruct her release, we'll be forced to escalate this matter further, and I can assure you, that's not a road you want to go down. Blake clenches his jaw, his thoughts swirling in a mix of frustration and fear. The reality of the situation is hitting him hard, but part of him still clings to the idea that he was justified in his actions, that he wasn't wrong to follow his instincts. Even if those instincts were influenced by biases, he refused if Kusa to acknowledge. Before Blake can say anything else, the station's captain, a burly man in his fifties with a no-nonsense attitude, strides into the room. His face is set in a grim frown as he takes in the scene. Blake, we need to talk, the captain says, his voice brooking no argument. In my office. Now, Blake stiffens but nods, casting one last glance at Agent Briggs before following the captain into the office. The door closes behind them with a heavy thud, leaving Blake standing in front of the captain's desk, trying to maintain his composure. The captain doesn't waste any time. What the hell is going on, Blake? He snaps, his eyes blazing with frustration. We've got the Secret Service breathing down our necks because of this. Why wasn't I informed that you were holding a federal agent? Blake shifts uncomfortably. I didn't know she was an agent at first. She wasn't acting like one. The car wasn't registered to her, and the whole situation seemed suspicious. I was following protocol. Protocol. The captain interrupts, incredulous. Detaining a secret service agent based on a hunch is not protocol, Blake. You've crossed the Easter line, and now you've put this department in a very dangerous position. Blake bristles at the accusation. With all due respect, sir, I believe I was right to be cautious. She had an encrypted device in the car. The captain holds up a hand to stop him. Enough. This isn't about what you believed. This is about what you did. You should have handled this differently the moment you realized who she was. Now we're in damage control mode. Agent Williams is being released, and you're going to personally escort her out of here and apologize. Flake's stomach drops at the thought. Apologize? To her? His pride flares up, but he knows there's no room to argue. It's already in deep, deep enough trouble as it is. Yes, sir, Blake mutters through gritted teeth, his face burning with humiliation. The captain stares him down for a long moment, clearly disappointed. I expect better judgment from you, Blake. This is going on your record, and there will be consequences. Now go. Fix this before it gets worse. Blake nods stiffly and exits the office, feeling a mix of anger and shame. As he makes his way back to the holding area, his mind races with conflicting emotions. Part of him wants to stand his ground, to argue that he was right all along, but deep down, he knows he's lost control of the situation. But when Blake arrives at the holding area, 
He finds Hansen standing by, looking more conflicted than ever. Hansen glances at Blake, unsure of what to say, but before he can speak, Blake brushes past him and unlocks the cell where Nika is being held. Gas stands as soon as the door swings open, her expression calm but speely. She knows the power dynamic is shifting in her favour, but that doesn't erase the homes of her. Blake can feel her eyes on him, and for the first time all day, he feels a flicker of guilt. Agent Williams, Blake says, his voice stiff and formal. You're free to go. I apologise for the misunderstanding. She watches him closely, her gaze unwavering. She doesn't say anything for a long moment, letting the weight of his words hang in the air. Finally, she steps forward, her posture straight and dignified despite everything she's been through. And I hope this serves as a lesson, Officer Blake Nicker says, her voice low but firm. Assumptions and biases don't just harm innocent people, they undermine the very system you're supposed to protect. Blake swallows hard, his pride warring with the growing realisation that he's in the wrong. He opens his mouth to respond, but no words come. Nicker turns and walks out of the cell, heading toward the front desk where Agent Briggs is waiting. As she approaches, Briggs gives her a nod of respect, then turns his attention back to the officers at the desk. Agent Williams will be leaving with me. We'll handle the rest from here. The officers at the desk nod clearly aware of the tension in the room. They move quickly to return Nika's belongings, including the encrypted tablet that had caused so much trouble. Nika takes it without a word, her mind already moving past the ordeal and on to the next steps. This isn't over, not by a long shot. As Nika and Briggs exit this, the station, the cool air outside fight fight a relief after the claustrophobic tension of the police station. Briggs walks alongside her, his expression serious but supportive. You handled that well, Nika, he says after a moment. I know it wasn't easy, but you kept your composure. That's what matters. Kanika nods, though her mind is still processing everything that's happened. It shouldn't have come to this, she says, her voice tight. He had no reason to detain me. And yet here we are. How many others go through this without the resources or the status to fight back? Briggs sighs, his expression grim. Too many. But we'll make sure this doesn't get swept under the rug. Blake and the department will face consequences for this. Nicker's gaze hardens. It's not just about consequences. It's about the bigger picture. This isn't just one bad cop making a mistake. It's a system that allows this kind of behavior to continue. Briggs nods in agreement, though there's a weariness in his eyes. I know, and we'll keep fighting it. But right now we need to get you back to HQ. The higher-ups want a full report on what happened. As they walk toward the black sub parked at the curb, Nika can't help but glance back at the police station the weight of the day's events settling on her shoulders. She knows that this is just the beginning of a much larger battle, one that goes far beyond her own experience. But for now, she's content with one small victory, she's free, and she's not done fighting. As the car pulls away from the station, Nika stares out the window, her thoughts racing. There's still so much to be done, and she's already planning her next move. The truth is, the system may be broken, but Nika Williams is far from broken. And that's what makes her dangerous to those who see stick to abuse their power. As the black sub drives away from the station, Nika sits in the passenger seat, her hands resting in her lap. The events of the day weigh heavily on her, but she refuses to let the frustration overwhelm her. Her thoughts are focused now, razor sharp. The system is flawed and her wrongful detainment is just another symptom of a much deeper problem. Beside her, Special Agent Tyler Briggs is silent, his eyes fixed on the road. The tension between them is palpable, but it's not directed at one another. It's the shared understanding that what happened today was not an isolated incident, but part of a much larger systemic issue. They've both seen it before. Good officers getting caught up in their own biases, departments willing to overlook the misconduct of their own, and innocent people paying the price. Tinika turns toward the window, 
watching the cityscape blur by. The relief of being free from that cell is quickly giving way to a determination that is all too familiar. This was a fight she had faced her entire career, but today's incident made it personal. I can't let this go, Nika says finally, her voice cutting through the silence in the car. I need to see this through, Tyler. Griggs glances over at her, his expression somber but knowing. I figured you'd say that, as we'll make sure this gets handled. I've already contacted our legal department. They're preparing to file formal complaints against Blake and the department. It won't be easy, but we have a strong case, but what they did to you was completely illegal. Nika shakes her head. It's not enough. Blake is just a symptom. There's something deeper here, a culture that allows these kinds of abuses to happen. It's not just about him. It's about the department, the training, the way these officers think they can get away with this kind of behavior. They don't just need to be punished. The system needs to change. Big Riggs exhales slowly, his grip tightening on the steering wheel. You're not wrong, but you know how these things go. It's a long uphill battle. And it takes more than just one case to change a system like that. Nikos' jaw tightens. I know. But this time, I'm not backing down. I want full accountability, not just for Blake, but for the entire department. They need to understand that they can't just sweep this under the rug. Not this time. Briggs nods, though there's a hint of concern in his eyes. He's known Nika for years, worked with her on countless cases, and he knows how relentless she can be when something needs to be done. But he also knows that going up against a system like this can take a toll, not just professionally, but personally. He'll back you up, Nika, he says, his voice steady. But just be careful. When you push against something as big as this, they push back hard. Gata turns her gaze toward him, her eyes filled with determination. I'm ready. They drive in silence for the next several minutes, the weight of the conversation hanging between them. Nika's mind races, formulating the steps she'll need to take to expose the corruption she's certain runs deep within the department. It's not just about what happened to her today, it's about every person who's been wrongfully detained, harassed, or brutalized by officers who abuse their power. She has the resources, the platform, and the drive to make sure this story gets out. But just as they pull onto the highway, Nika's phone buzzes in her pocket. She pulls it out and glances at the screen. It's a message from a trusted contact within the Secret Service's legal team. Urgent, Blake's department is trying to cover this up. They're spinning the narrative, be ready. Nika's heart sinks, but her resolve hardens. She shows the message to Briggs, who glances at it briefly before muttering a curse under his breath. They're trying to get ahead of it, he says, his voice filled with frustration. Damage control. Of course they are, Nika replies, her voice sharp. They know they screwed up, so they'll do everything they can to make it look like this was all a misunderstanding, like I somehow overreacted or worse, that I'm guilty of something. They'll try to paint me as the problem. Briggs's expression is grim. We can't let that happen. We need to get ahead of this. Fast. Nika nods, already thinking several steps ahead. I'll get in touch with our media relations team. We need to go public with this before they have a chance to spin it. The truth needs to come out, and it needs to come out now. Briggs riches into his pocket, pulling out his phone. I'll coordinate with our team. But we need to get our story straight, make sure the facts are out there before they can muddy the waters. As Briggs styles, Nika begins typing furiously on her own phone, reaching out to contacts she's made over the years in the media. She knows that if they can control the narrative, they'll have a chance to expose the truth before the department has a chance to bury it. But just as she's about to hit send on a message, her phone buzzes again. This time it's a call from an unknown number. Nika hesitates for a moment, then answers. Dear Williams, she says, her voice sharp. It's Nika, it's Hanson. The sound of Officer Hanson's voice takes her by surprise. She hadn't expected to hear from him again, 
especially not so soon after her release. There's a pause on the other end of the line, and Nika can hear the anxiety in his breath. Hansen, Nika says, her tone cautious. What do you want? I, I need to talk to you, Hansen stammers, his voice low and hurried. Something's going on at the station. Blake's been pulling some strings. They're trying to frame you. Ginaika's heart skips a beat, and she glances at Briggs, who is still on his core. What do you mean they're trying to frame me? Hansen's voice is shaky, but he pushes forward. I don't know the full details, but Blake's working with the department's internal affairs unit. They're going to claim that, that the tablet we confiscated from you had classified information on it, information you weren't authorized to have. So they're going to say you were involved in some kind of illegal surveillance operation. I overheard them talking about it after you left. Kinaika's blood runs cold, but she keeps her voice steady. Are you telling me they're fabricating evidence against me against? Yes, Unsen says, his voice filled with desperation. Blake's trying to cover his tracks and he's pulling the department in with him. Are they going to try to make it look like you were involved in something illegal? And they've already started drafting the report. Nika's grip tightens on her phone. Why are you telling me this? Why now? Hansen's pause is telling. Because, because I know this isn't right. I didn't stop it when I should have. I let it happen. But I can't let them ruin your life for something you didn't do. Nika is silent for a moment, her mind racing. Hansen's confession is both a lifeline and a ticking time bomb. If what he's saying is true, then the department is moving quickly to not only bury the truth, but to destroy her reputation in the process. And if they succeed, her career, everything she's worked for will be over. And I need proof, Hansen, Nika says finally, her voice cold and precise. If you're telling the truth, I need something concrete, a recording, documents, anything that shows they're fabricating this. Hansen hesitates, but then his voice steadies. I'll get it to you, but you have to move fast. They're going to make their move soon. Guess Nika's heart pounds as she hangs up the phone, her mind a flurry of thoughts. She turns to Briggs, who has just finished his own call. They're setting me up, Nika says, her voice tight with anger. Blake's working with internal affairs. They're going to claim I was involved in illegal surveillance. Hansen just called to warn me. Briggs's face hardens, his eyes narrowing in anger. So they're going full on with the cover up. This is bad, really bad. Nika takes a deep breath, her mind racing. We need to act fast. If Hansen can get us proof, we can blow this wide open. But we need to be ready for them to push back hard. Briggs nods, his jaw clenched. I'll get our legal team on this. We need to prepare for a media blitz, and we need to make sure they don't have time to release their fabricated evidence. Nika nods, her thoughts moving at lightning speed. I'll reach out to my contacts in the press. We'll make sure the truth gets out before they can destroy me. The two agents work in tandem for the next few hours, coordinating with legal teams, media contacts and tr trusted colleagues within the Secret Service. Every minute feels like a countdown to an inevitable clash, a battle not just for Nika's career, but for the truth itself. Hours later, as the sun begins to set, Nika's phone buzzes again. It's another message from Hansen. I've got the recording. Sending it now. Nika's heart leaps as she quickly opens the attachment. It's an audio file and she presses play, her pulse racing. The voices on the recording are clear. Blake's voice, along with two other officers, discussing the plan to frame Nika. They're talking about planting false evidence manipulating the encrypted tablet's data and coordinating with internal affairs to create a narrative that will make it look like Nika was engaged in illegal activity. Nika's blood boils as she listens, but her mind is focused. This is the proof she needed. The recording is undeniable a damning indictment of Blake and the entire department's corrupt actions. Without missing a beat, Nika forwards the recording to Briggs, along with a message. We have them. Briggs calls her immediately. This is it, Nika. This is what's exactly what we needed. 
I'm sending this to our legal term now. They'll go public with it within the hour. Kamika breathes a sigh of relief, but it's laced with exhaustion. The battle isn't over yet, but for the first time all day, she feels like she has the upper hand. As the Suv continues down the road, Nika stares out at the darkening sky, her mind still racing. The department tried to destroy her, but now, with Hansen's help, she has the weapon she needs to expose the truth, and she won't stop until justice is served, not just for herself, but for everyone who's ever been wronged by the very people sworn to protect them. Tomorrow, the world will know the truth. Hika's pulse quickens as she and Agent Briggs sit in the dimly lit conference room at Sacred Secrets headquarters, surrounded by their legal team and trusted colleagues. The air is tense, filled with the quiet hum of phones buzzing and fingers tapping on keyboards. Everyone is preparing for what's about to happen, a media storm that could either destroy her or expose the corruption that had put her in this position in the first place, eh? From the table in front of her sits the evidence that will make or break the case, Hansen's recording. Blake and his accomplices have been caught plotting to fabricate evidence, manipulate the encrypted tablet's data. The recording is crystal clear, the voice is unmistakable, and there's no way Blake can spin his way out of this now. Across from Nicker, Briggs is deep in conversation with one of the agency's senior attorneys, his tone clipped but urgent. If we go public with this now, before Blake's department has a chance to release their fabricated narrative. If we don't control the timing, they'll have the upper hand. The attorney nods, his eyes scanning the text of a press release that will be distributed within the hour. We've got the recording and we've already already filed formal complaints with the Department of Justice and the local police oversight board. This is solid, but we need to brace for the fallout. Nika exhales slowly, the tension in her shoulders finally starting to ease. She knows this is only the beginning, but it's the turning point she's been fighting for since the moment Blake slapped the cuffs on her. She's no longer on the defensive. Now, she's the one pushing back. A knock on the door interrupts the conversation, and a junior agent steps in, holding a tablet. The press is ready, awaiting for a statement. Briggs nods and glances at Nika. You ready for this? Kinnika straightens in her chair, her eyes hardening with resolve. I've been ready since the moment they tried to ruin me. Now let's do this. With that, the team moves swiftly into action. The press release is sent out to major media outlets, accompanied by the damning audio recording. Within minutes, newsrooms across the country are scrambling to break the story. Sacred service agent wrongfully detained, Corporal Ao. Kia watches as the headlines flash across the shone of the screen of the tablet in front of her. The truth is finally out, and there's no turning back now. She knows Blake and his department will be reeling from this, but she also knows they won't go down without a fight. Just as the first wave of news reports hits the airwaves, Nika's phone buzzes. It's a message from an old friend in the media someone she's worked with before on high-profile cybersecurity cases. This story is blowing up. You need to get ready for the backlash that I'm going to take this lying down. But be careful. I'll fall. The Nika takes a deep breath, her fingers tightening around the phone. She knew this moment was coming. Blake and the others wouldn't just roll over. They'd push back hard, and she had to be ready for anything. As if on cue, the conference room door swings open again, and the head of the Secret Service's Public Affairs Division enters, her face set in a grim expression. We've just received word from the local police department. They're preparing a response, and it's not good. They're denying everything, claiming the recording was doctored. Because jaw tightens, the anger simmering just beneath the surface. Of course they are. That's the only play they have left. The public affairs officer nods. They're also pushing the narrative that this was a case of mistaken identity, that Blake didn't know you were an agent until it was too late Sunday. They're trying to frame it as a miscommunication and claiming you resisted arrest. Kanika clenches her fists, the injustice of the situation re rekindling her fury. They're doubling down on the lie. Briggs steps forward, his voice calm but authoritative. We anticipated this. 
It's a desperate move. Our job now is to stay focused on the facts. The recording speaks for itself and we've already initiated legal action. Their response only makes them look more guilty. The legal team nods in agreement, but Nika can feel the weight of the moment pressing down on her. This isn't just about clearing her name anymore, it's about exposing the rot at the core of a system that had allowed officers like Blake to operate with impunity for far too long. The stakes are higher than ever. The Briggs turns to Nika, his gaze steady. We need to stay ahead of them. The press is going to want a statement from you. Something personal. If you don't have to do this if you're not ready, but if you speak out now, it could make a huge difference. Kia considers his words for a moment, the gravity of the situation sinking in. She's always been a behind-the-scenes operator, someone who worked quietly but effectively. But this time, it's different. The fight has become personal, and the only way to truly expose the truth is to step into the spotlight herself. I'll do it. Nika says finally, her voice steady with conviction. I'm not letting them get away with this. The team springs into action, setting up a small press conference in one of the building's briefing rooms. Nika is given a few minutes to collect her thoughts, but she doesn't need long. The words have been forming in her mind since the moment Blake tried to ruin her. As she steps in front of the cameras, the lights are blinding and the hum of reporters' murmurs fills the air. The stakes are high and she knows every word she says will be scrutinized. But she also knows this is her chance to finally be heard. She clears her throat and the room falls silent. My name is Nika Williams, she begins, her voice clear and unwavering. I am an agent with the United States Secret Service and for the past several hours I have been fighting to clear my name after being wrongfully detained by officers of the local police to police department. What happened to me was not an isolated incident. It was the result of systemic bias, corruption, and a willingness to abuse power. She pauses, letting the words sink in. The officers involved in my detainment, led by Officer Blake, not only violated my rights, but they conspired to fabricate evidence and cover up their misconduct. Thanks to the brave actions of a whistleblower within their department, we have obtained proof of their actions and we have made the proof available to the public. Kinnika's eyes sweep across the room, meeting the gazes of the reporters and cameras that are broadcasting her words dived to millions of viewers. This is not just about me. This is about every person who has been wrongfully detained, harassed or mistreated by law enforcement officers who believe they are above the law. It's about a system that allows these abuses to continue unchecked. But today we are fighting back. As she takes a deep breath, the weight of her words heavy but necessary. But will not stop until there is full accountability for the actions taken against me. Officer Blake and his accomplices will face justice for what they've done. And I will continue to work, not just for myself, but for every person who has been a victim of this broken system. Nika steps back from the podium, her heart pounding in her chest. The room is silent for a moment, and then the questions begin to pour in. But Nika doesn't hear them. She's already turning to leave, her mind focused on what comes next. She exits the room. Briggs is waiting for her. A proud but concerned look on his face. That was powerful, Nika. You're going to make waves with that. Nika nods, though she's still processing everything that's just happened. I just hope it's enough. Biggs places a hand on her shoulder. It will be. We've got the truth on our side. For now, the whole world knows it. As they walk down the hall together, Nika feels a sense of resolve settle over her. The fight isn't over. Not by a long shot, but for the first time in days, she feels like she has the power to win. The system may be broken, but with the truth now out in the open, the pieces are finally starting to fall into place. The aftermath of Nika's press conference is a whirlwind. The story dominates the news cycle for days with headlines splashed across of major networks. Secret service agent falsely accused, evidence tampering, pleas at corruption are exposed and whistle whistleblower cutter blower reveals plot to frame federal agent. The public reaction is swift and fierce. There's an outpouring of support for Nika, 
as well as growing outrage directed at Officer Blake and his department. The tides have turned, and it's clear that Nika's fight is now the nation's fight. Inside Secret Service headquarters, Nika watches the coverage on a television screen in the hallway, surrounded by her colleagues. The weight of what's happened hasn't fully lifted from her shoulders, but there's a palpable sense of victory in the air. She had fought back against the system and won. Special Agent Briggs approaches, his expression one of quiet satisfaction. You did it, Nika. They can't bury this now. Nika gives a small nod. Though her mind is still processing the scale of what's transpired, it doesn't feel real yet, she admits. It's hard to believe we're finally on the other side of this. Briggs nods thoughtfully. I get that but we've got momentum now, and we're not letting our how of it. The Department of Justice is launching an official investigation into Blake and the entire precinct. Internal affairs won't be able to protect him anymore. The news should bring relief, and in some ways it does. But Nika also knows this is just the beginning. There's still a long road ahead for her, for the whistleblower Hansen, and for everyone else who's been affected by the corruption they've uncovered. I know, Nika says her voice steady. But this isn't just about Blake, it's about the entire system. He's one officer, but there are plenty more like him. This fight is far from over. Briggs offers her a reassuring smile, and you're the one leading the war. Don't forget that, Art. Kinnika looks back at the television, watching as a panel of analysts discusses the implications of the case. They're talking about police reform, about systemic racism, about accountability. It's the conversation that needed to happen, the one she'd hoped her ordeal would spark, and now it's finally happening. The next few weeks are a blur of legal battles, public appearances, and internal reviews. Blake is suspended from duty, pending a full investigation, and several of his colleagues are implicated in the conspiracy to frame Nika. The fallout is immense, with calls for sweeping reforms within the department. Officers like Blake, who had operated unchecked for years, are finally being held accountable. Hansen, the whistleblower who risked his career to bring the truth to light, is also facing his own challenges. While his actions were crucial in exposing Blake's corruption, he's met with resistance within his own ranks. Many of his fellow officers see him as a traitor, someone who broke the unspoken code of loyalty among the force. But Hansen stands firm, knowing that what he did was right. With the backing of the Secret Service and public support, he's placed under federal protection, ensuring his safety as the investigation unfolds. One afternoon, Nika receives a call from Hansen. His voice is quieter than she remembers, but there's a hint of relief in it. Williams, he says, I just wanted to say thank you. For everything. You didn't have to help me after all of this, but you did. Nika leans back in her chair, glancing out the window at the city below. You did the right thing, Hanson. You didn't just help me. You helped expose something that could have kept happening, but that took courage. There's a brief pause on the other end. Yeah, well, I guess I had to make up for standing by for too long. I'm glad it's all coming out now, though. People need to know. They do, Nico agrees, and now they will. As the weeks turn into months, the legal process grins forward. Blake is charged with multiple counts of evidence tampering, false arrest and conspiracy. His case becomes a flashpoint in the national debate over police reform, with civil rights organizations calling for deeper investigations into law enforcement practices across the country. The public is watching closely, and for the first time in years, there's a real sense that change might be possible. Gar, meanwhile, returns to her work at the Secret Service, but things are different now. Her case has elevated her profile, not just within the agency, but across the country. But she's invited to speak at conferences, to join panels on criminal justice reform and to meet with lawmakers who are pushing for legislation aimed at addressing the systemic issues that her case highlighted. But through it all, Nika remains grounded. She knows that while her battle may have been won, 
the larger fight is ongoing. Every victory is hard won, and there are still countless people facing the same injustices she fought against. The one evening, as Nika is leaving the office, she pauses in the lobby, looking at a framed photograph of the agency's emblem on the wall. As she reflects on everything that's happened, the fear, the anger, the determination, and ultimately the victory. It's been a harrowing journey, but she knows it was necessary. Not just for herself, but for everyone who had been silenced, ignored, or begged now. Fix walks up beside her, following her gaze to the emblem. You did something big here, Nika. Don't forget that. Gatter turns to him, a small smile tugging at the corners of her mouth. I didn't do it alone. Briggs chuckles. Maybe not. But you're the one who stood in front of the world and told the truth. That's something no one can take away from you. Tyker nods, feeling the weight of his words. Thanks, Tyler. I just hope this is the start of something bigger. It is, he says confidently. And it's not over yet. Not by a long shot. As Nika steps outside into the cool evening air, she takes a deep breath, letting the crisp breeze wash over her. The world feels a little different now, more hopeful but still challenging. She knows there will be more battles to come, more obstacles to face. She also knows that she's ready for them. She walks down the street, her mind already turning to the future. The fight for justice is far from over, but for now she takes solace in the fact that for the first time in a long time, the truth has won. And as long as she's standing, she'll keep fighting for what's right. Because, in the end, that's what this was always about. Not just clearing her name, but fighting for a world where no one has to go through what she did. And that's a fight worth having. As the night settles in around her, Nika walks forward with a sense of purpose. The road ahead is long but it's one she's ready to face step by step.